Welcome to a long-awaited edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 802. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is May 16th, 2023. All right, welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. Yes, we took a two-week break. We deserved it. Reporting on on GAFCON from my office chair here in Wisconsin was really hard. And and then George went, and he he went to GAFCON. And now George went to Rome. You didn't go to Rome for the wrong reasons, right? Not for the food, no. I didn't (laughs) go for the food. (laughs) Not for the timer. (laughs) Well, before we get too far into this episode, this is a great opportunity after a two-week break to remind you to like this episode, share this episode. If you have not subscribed to the program yet, subscribe. If you like what George and I say, go to the comment section and tell us so. If you disagree or have another point of opinion or have updated information, go to the comment section on YouTube and tell us what you think. George, welcome back from Rome. You got back at 3 a.m. I got you on camera here. Uh, What did you do in Rome? I went through every single priest shirt because I (laughs) sweated it all through them. So I have no, it's all in the laundry. Susan, my wife's doing it now. Uh I attended a course uh, taught at the Legionnaires of Christ University, the uh, uh, Ateneo Pontifico Regina Apostolorum. And it's the only course in the Christian world on exorcism, the theology, the theory, the scriptural underpinnings, as well as the practice. And this is the course required to be taken by all exorcists in Italy, at least, who who are going to be appointed as exorcists. And... It basically is the only game in town, and it was started by okay, Father Gabriel. Only game in town, or only game in the world? I heard this is only game of the world. Oh, only okay. game in the world. Okay, right. um, and for a liturgical Christian, I'm mm. sure you can find deliverance many courses, lots of places. But yeah. the formal courses that use the rites of the Anglican churches and the Catholic Church. Let me start off by saying that the overlap between Catholicism and Anglicanism on this area is about 90, 99 tenths. Uh, They just use a different rite than we do, but for all intents and purposes, the same words, the same wording, it's there. So everything that I learned, there's some stuff that was a little dull for me. The evolution of canon law on exorcism, eh, a little tedious. But the practical classes, the theological classes were fantastic. And I learned so many things. Kevin and I have, we've had to reshoot this because I tried to boil down 50 hours, 40, 50 hours of classes. And we're what? We're about four hours filming? Yeah, something uh, like that. Like, uh, and, oh, yeah. My battery's going out, George. Stop. <laughs> and so let me just say, if you have specific questions, just write to me offline and I'll do my mm-hmm. best to answer them. Mm-hmm. Um, 140 people there, lay and clergy. Uh, four Anglicans, two Episcopalians, myself and Trey Garland, who's a friend who watches this show. Uh, he used to be in Central Florida, he's now in Chicago, and also been in Dallas. And two people from the ACNA, Teresa Yarnos, who is, uh, heads a ministry for people coming out of cults, mm-hmm. and Lee Stafke, who is the prelate, or the head of the Order of St. Michael, which is the ACNA's exorcism ministry training program. There were the four of us, and the rest were Roman Catholics. Um, There's some lay uh, teachers and whatnot, but the vast majority, 125 or so, were priests from all over the world of every stripe. From I became, I became very friendly with a fellow who's Irish who had been Cardinal Pell's private secretary, who's now going to head up the Irish Church in Rome, and I have no doubt one day he'll be a cardinal too. He's one of those high flyers. And then I became very friendly with a, a South Korean seminarian, the Korean Pontifical College is next door. His bishop asked him to go so that he'll be the exorcist for the diocese of Huang, uh, whatever, he'll be a diocesan exorcist when he gets back. As well as uh, I met a Franciscan from the Lebanon uh, who he had sandals and he wasn't wearing Birkenstocks. Uh, he was wearing what looked like old tires that had been chopped up and had little pieces of rope. And he didn't have a laptop like I did and earphones. Uh, he spoke Italian, so he didn't need to help. 
but he just had pieces, scraps of paper. He'd write stuff down, and all his worldly goods basically were with him in his brown uh, robe, his uh, his rosary, his cross, and his cincture. You know, you just see that spread. I could, had a great time lunches with uh, people from England, from India, from South America, from all over the world. Majority language was Italian, second was Spanish, third was Portuguese, and fourth would be English, and then Polish and German, and so on and so on. Okay, well, I, I have a question. Okay, when people think of exorcism, they think of Hollywood's exorcist or uh, all these stagmata movies and, and uh, everything that's not zombie is exorcist. And are the, is that what they're teaching you? Go into a dark room and, and pour holy water, water around and, and you're all done? No. Uh, the movie The Exorcist, the movie The Pope's Exorcist, which just came out starring Russell Crowe, have a much to do with real exorcism as Abbott and Costello meet the mummy uh, does. It, <laughs> and the major point, now, Father Amorth, who was who grew, was played by Russell Crowe, some of the Italians said, oh, he doesn't look anything like Father Amorth. And Father Amorth was one of these guys who was very excitable, talked with his hands and this and that and so on. So it wasn't a true portrait for m many of these fellows who are all the, who, the senior professors are all in their 70s and 80s have known this man all their life. But really the point they wanted to make was that exorcism isn't scary. It's no dark music. It's no dark moods. It's no thing, nothing that a Hollywood film wants to have of fright things it is joy it is light because christ is present battling and defeating the demons now i heard stories about you know projectile vomiting and all this different stuff that except for the head spinning around uh, in the exorcist that does nobody said oh that never happens but a lot of the other stuff they say they've seen but they Put it in the context of the exorcist ministry is a ministry of joy. The watchwords are charity and humility. It is uh, an exorcism is a sacramental. In the Anglican tradition, in the Thirty Nine Articles, we read that the F the worthiness of the minister in no way impacts the sacraments. So a real skunk can baptize and serve Holy Communion, and it's still valid. A sacramental, which is stuff like ashes on Ash Wednesday, holy water, exorcism. Uh, is from the book of James and other parts of the Bible where go to a pious and worthy person, an elder, and the, the prayers of a worthy person are heard more loudly. So if you don't believe, if you're a skunk of a priest, you can do a great mass, but you'll be a lousy exorcist. <coughs> and the thing that, that I was told, but with both examples and in theory and in scriptural practice, is that if you go to perform an exorcism, and if you have unconfessed sin in your heart, the devil's going to throw that right back at you, and you're going to get nowhere. Uh, one, a French Canadian Dominican, uh, Father Delmine, Francois Marie, uh, Father Francois Marie, said he performed an exorcist, and one of his compatriots in the Dominican Provincial Order wanted to come, and he didn't believe any of this stuff, and they started the exorcism, they started the rite, and the possessed person turned to the other priest who was just sitting off to the side observing, and he proceeded to say, you know, I know your sins with women, and uh, you are going to hell, and all this and that. And the, the, the visiting priest got up and left because he did have unconfessed sins on his heart. I don't know what they were, but they had something to do with girls, and he had never confessed that sin. The dev But here's the thing, and we were told, even if he had, but if he had confessed that sin, that is wiped away from Satan because the blood of Christ covers all your sins that have been confessed and of which you've repented. So, Satan, so an exorcist. They, okay, I, I, well, I, I, well, okay, I have another question then. I have a, uh, a priest, he was my priest in the 90s, uh, attended an exorcism. And before he went, uh, he was all frantic, and I'm, I'm going to an exorcist, I'm going to go with another a trained exorcist and stuff like that. And about an hour later, he came back and said, uh, it was just a mental health issue, it was not uh, a demon. Yeah, 98%, they say, of the cases they are asked to investigate are mental health related. Okay. Or physically read. You have a brain tumor, you have schizophrenia, you have borderline personality disorder, you have dissociative disorder. 
and the uh, the way they do it with the modern right. They had one right that was instituted the Catholics in 1614, which was updated in 2004. It was the last of the updates from Vatican II. And the old right was very detailed, had multiple prayers, and you asked questions, the exorcist asked questions of the devil. What is your name? When did this start? When are you leaving? All this and that. The new right doesn't ask any questions of the devil, the theory being the devil's a liar, and he may tell you stuff that's a complete lie, and you should just proceed in the power of Christ and not try to cross-examine him if it's your Perry Mason. And the the thing is, though, that uh, before they even get to this stage, the modern right requires that you have a medical evaluation, you have a psychiatric evaluation or psychological evaluation. You just don't start up by saying, you know, the power of Christ compels you to go away, demon. Now, one of the things that was said that was very touching, I thought, was that uh, one exorcist said he was asked to come in and see somebody. Uh, he was asked by uh, the psychiatrist and the person's parish priest and he met with the fellow and after a while he said no you're not possessed and the man was very disappointed because he was schizophrenic and if he were possessed he could be cured but if he's schizophrenic he knows he's never going to be cured okay so all right yeah. so if I've got so much, I don't. I, I don't want to hijack. The, you know, our picking. We, on no, dust. we could probably do. Yeah, we could do three, or, three or four episodes here. So, if they do have more information, lo and behold, you, your email just popped up below your chin. They can contact you there or put some stuff in the comments. Now, the comment section, <laughs> go for it if you want. Is not where you go and discuss whether or not you can cast out demons have fun if that's your desire but if you want to ask George more about this use his email one thing I should add there are three levels there's prayers of deliverance mm -hmm. anybody can do that and deliverance ministries are very big in the United States and sure. that's where you the person praying ask Jesus to do this in the life of somebody else it's like a triangular procession you're not doing it. You're asking Jesus to do it. If you're an unworthy person, your prayers may not be heard, and so on and so forth. There's a minor exorcism, which we perform in the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church in baptism. And a priest or deacon can baptize. And a layperson can baptize in an emergency. And that's, uh, do you renounce Satan as all his works and vanities and pomps and everything? That's the minor exorcism. The major exorcism, which in the Episcopal Book of Occasional Prayer, and in the Roman Rite for Exorcism, and I don't know what the Anglican book is called, um, that can only be done by a priest who has written authority to do it by his bishop. There are no Lone Rangers here. I just can't set up and be an exorcist now. The next step for me is to go find an exorcist and spend some time being his pupil, uh, checking out the local Catholic diocese. And then I go to the Diocese of Central Florida, mm -hmm and say, if it is your will, Bishop Justin Holcomb, who'll be bishop next month, please know that this is something I've been trained in. But no, I can't start doing exorcisms tomorrow. But I can do deliverance ministry tomorrow, as can you, Kevin, as can anybody. Because it's uh, Jesus asking. Yes. Because the exorcism is a ministry of the church. It's a sacramental. And the authority, the keys of the kingdom are given to the priests you know, I can bind in heaven, and I can bind on earth what is bound in heaven. I can loose on earth what is loosed in heaven because of my ordination. That's the theory for a liturgical church. Episcopalians, Anglicans, Lutherans. There were no Orthodox present because they have a different understanding of free will and original sin. So they don't match, but we Anglicans and probably Lutherans match almost pretty up one-to-one -one with Catholics. I, I agree with you. All right, let's move on to some news. This is the first news story. And this is great. We just pared that down from four hours to 14 minutes. That's, you That's you know what you're doing. It's <laughs> not your first time summarizing something. All right, George, let's talk about Archbishop John Semtamnu from the Church of England. And uh, over your time in Rome, some stories broke, and he got himself in trouble and lost his PTO. 
Let's, let's talk about that. Yeah, it, it's a it's a little uh, Ford Mustang. No, <laughs> uh, right. permission to officiate. It's not a GTO. <laughs> uh, Johnson Tomo. I must say, I've never quite cared for him. I always felt he was a bit of a I don't well. He was a bit of a showman. And he used his exotic origins and way of speaking to advance his career. Uh, that's unkind, and I apologize for that, but I've never quite trusted him. Well, when Johnson Tommy was Archbishop of York, uh, a man, Matthew Innocent, came to him. Innocent was a priest, Diocese of Sheffield. And Matt Innocent said that when he was a teenage boy, he was molested by another priest who was still active in the Church of England. Trevor, and last name is Devamanikam. Div- it's an Indian. It's close enough, yes. And the, he reported this to Stephen Croft, who at that time was the Bishop of Sheffield, and also to Archbishop of York, of York who is Croft's boss. Neither did anything. Eventually, it became a criminal matter, and Vanikam killed himself before he went to trial. The And for years, Innocent has protested that the church did nothing, did nothing. Well, an independent report was written and released on Saturday, this past Saturday, that said, yes, St. Thomas did nothing. And Stephen Croft, who's now the Bishop of Oxford, he did nothing. And, and they violated the letter and the spirit of church law. Well, St. Thomas put out a statement saying, it wasn't my job. I knew about it, but I thought uh, I thought Croft would take care of it. Well, this did not go down well on social media, and there were calls for him to be disciplined because, you know, remember when George Carey, for having a pervert student when he was the dean of a college, it was a day student whom he had met maybe once, he was disciplined by Justin Weldy for not picking up the fact this guy was a creep. This was yep. uh, the John, but that that was guilty John. by association. That was John Smythe. Mm, yeah. So Welby has no problems disciplining conservatives for even the slightest appearance of impropriety. Nothing has happened to Croft whatsoever. And Welby is now cross boss. Helen Ann Hartley was the new bishop of Newcastle, where St. Thomas retired and where he has a PTO. On Sunday, put out a statement saying, I've asked Archbishop St. Thomas to step back from the ministry over the Devanakam, over the Trevor affair. So Sintamo basically, uh, for all intents and purposes, cannot function as a priest anymore, mm-hmm. or as an archbishop. Now here's the thing, Welby had more knowledge of the John Smythe and uh, Jonathan Fletcher cases, and if you hold Welby to that standard, he should be forced to step back too. And it's incredible that Stephen Croft has not been disciplined. But he's the Bishop of Oxford, and he's on side with Welby. He's one of Welby's allies. He was one. He was the guy who put out that letter when they were discussing same-sex blessings, saying this is why we have to do it. He's on the liberal side. Not going. He hasn't been touched so far. Well, I want to just give kudos to the Bishop of Newcastle. Mm-hmm. You know, accountability. You and I have a show, probably the most watched show on. YouTube regarding Anglican news because there's a lack of accountability. Okay. And now Helena, we, we have Helen Hartley, Helen on Hartley, the Bishop of Newcastle is in her forties now, mind mm-hmm. you. She's a young woman from our perspective and in the church's perspective. Yeah. And she has just taken out John Sintamo. That is quite a thing. Because Sintamo has a lot of significance out there who just sing his praises all day long. From the time he was Bishop of Stepney 30 years ago, talking about institutional racism in the church, the way he went up to Birmingham and then became York. There's these people that uh, like to have this exotic figure of St. Tamu to show how with it and cool we are. Well, now, yeah, we're cool because he's in the House of Lords, George. St. Tamu's appointment to the House of Lords was held up for a while after he retired. And it's not an automatic, but just in the last generation or so that David Hope and a few other bishops, those who haven't gone to Canterbury to become Archbishop of Canterbury, who stopped at York like David Hope, they become members of the House of Lords. Well, St. Thomas was held up because this review was still pending. 
And Sentamu's friend said, oh, this is racism. You know, the usual suspects said that because Sentamu is a black Ugandan, we just don't want to have a black bishop in parliament, all that nonsense. And so the church said, oh, well, just go ahead and do it. Now the question is, will Sentamu be stripped of his membership of the House of Lords? Because he has done safeguarding has been one of the great running wounds and sores of the Church of England in this generation. And St. Tamu is now the poster child of Episcopal neglect, Episcopal indifference, not my job mindset. I'm only the Archbishop. Let the Bishop figure it out. Well, well after he, the Bishop he, didn't do anything, it was his job to do it. He is famous for saying, I couldn't find those records, they were flooded. I had mm -hmm. a, a flood in the basement. Uh, he, he's really good at excuses. I would like to see accountability within the church. Good job, uh, Bishop Newcastle. But I'd like to see a little f follow up uh, as well, saying maybe the House of Lords lets him go. Yeah. Now, the difference between St. Tomo and another prominent case that broke this weekend as well is telling hmm. Peter Hollingsworth, former Archbishop of Brisbane in Australia. About 20 years ago, he was appointed Governor General. That's a political appointment. He's the Queen's representative of Australia. It's a big deal. No real actual power, but it is, if you will, the culmination of a life of public service. Hollingsworth, after two years, was forced to resign after it became known that when he was Archbishop of Brisbane, he turned a blind eye to clergy sexual abuse, reassigning people, telling people to leave the country. And I don't know for that. What <coughs> He just turned a blind eye to it. He did a Sentamo. Well, he was brought up on, he had to resign as governor general because of press pressure. And then a process began in the Aust Anglican Church of Australia to remove his orders. And after a very long series of trials and hearings and tribunals, they said, you did something wrong. You were a failure as a manager. You overlooked things, you were, you." You left things undone which you ought to have done, and you have done those things which you have ought not ought to not have done. And there is no help in you, Peter Hollingsworth, but you didn't molest a child. So we'll let you keep your orders as a priest. Well, there was an outcry in Australia so loud that Hollingsworth said, I'm glad that I can remain a priest, but I am voluntarily returning my PTO permission to officiate so that people don't get upset about this because they feel I've let down the church. Yeah. So Holling, it's where the difference is St. Tomo put out a press release saying, was it my fault? I just followed the rules. I can't help it if Croft messed up. Whereas Hollingsworth said, I understand appearances are against me and it's best for me in my retirement not to hold myself out as a priest or minister. If I were some time, I would say I'm not going to uh, uh, Croft goes, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, these these are inter it, it's sad that you know in the Anglican Church we have to report on this type of thing happening. Uh, but here's the thing: if Croft goes, he can take Welby down too. Um, Why do you it, think I said it? it? <laughs> well, <laughs> because there's and now the rumor is, of course, that now that he's crowned Charles, uh, you know, there's nothing left for uh, Justin Welby to screw up uh to do so he may he's 67 he may just pull the plug right now he can retire um we'll see what happens i don't that, know we did show notes and uh, it happened a long time ago but we haven't recorded since then um there's a new king yes all right cool. charles the third yeah that was a, a great so, thing to watch and i didn't see any major flub ups or screw ups and uh everything was even keel uh, they, they had some lip readers read uh, uh, Charles's uh, uh, impatience when he's in his carriage, but other than that, you know, not bad. Yeah. I am loath to get involved in the details. I've had emails from people saying, oh, the majesty of uh, Elizabeth's coronation, nothing, you know, Char uh, Charles's is nothing, and why do we have people like uh, Katy Perry and Elton John uh, well, in the congregation fine. as the, as the best of right. And it's like, you know, it doesn't really... It's politics. It, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, Gavin Ashton has written extensively on this. Mm -hmm. Will Charles be a Christian monarch? Um, at the end of the day, 
this is one of these local, it's a political issue. It's a social issue. It really isn't a faith issue for the Anglican world. But, but here, at the end of the day, as an Anglican, you pray for the king. You pray that Charles. he will be led to lead a Christian life of yeah, righteousness. Absolutely. You know, Char Charles doesn't lead England. He doesn't lead the Church of England. He doesn't appoint the bishops. Everything's done in his name. Mm -hmm. He, The person of the crown happen, is separate from the person of Charles Windsor. And I pray that uh, Charles has a happy reign. I pray everything goes well for him. Um, but let's let's just rejoice with the rest of the world at this wonderful spectacle and marvel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Justin Welby's sermon was short and simple. Yeah, People yeah. said, oh, you could have had a an opportunity to really preach the word. And c yeah, no, because the BBC fine. would have gone to commercial, yeah, that's uh, right. you know, and <laughs> Charles would have said, so going, you know, yeah, that's just, right. just get <laughs> off the stage and yeah. the book would appear and pull him out. It's not the first time this has happened to uh, Archbishop so, of Canterbury, yeah. So, so they, um, he, he did a good job. And um, the only thing that I think is fun is that when he, I only saw s snippets of this because I was actually traveling to Italy when this was occurring, and I, they had, uh, I was, got a cheap flight to Italy via Istanbul, and I was in the Istanbul airport, and they had the big uh, CNN International. It's the only time I see CNN is in airports and hotels. I don't, well, never mind. But they had Welby doing the crowning, and he's like, it's like he's trying to fit the, you know, I wish he had practiced a bit instead. Just put it on. Oh, it's fine. done. Instead of, but again, that was that's sort of funny. It's, it's, human. It, it's yeah, it's very human and and cool. Uh, I like that they had a lip reader tell us what George, what Charles was saying in the carriage. You know, I had to be. When are we getting to go? <laughs> no, he goes, well, he, he's basically. We're always late. <laughs> like <laughs> it's okay, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, but the, 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 there's human humanness and cuteness to it. Um, the fact that we have kings and queens in, in the 21st century is, is odd at best. Yes, he's a figurehead, and he only lasts as long as uh, the UK will have him. So. You know, but upcoming after him is William and, and Kate. We'll have to see what happens there. Um, all right, let's move on to some other news. All right, here's a name I have never heard before, ever. And I, I've been in uh, Christian ministry for the better part of 40-some years, uh, Anglican ministry, ministry for a long time as well. I've not heard the word Mike, word, the name Mike Pilavachi. Mike Pilavachi, the soul survivor. Never Kevin, heard. I I confess the same too. Uh, Mike Pilavachi is the founder of Soul Survivor. He's about our age in his early sixties, late fifties. Mm -hmm. I don't know how old he is, but he looks you know, awesome. our age. <laughs> and Soul Survivor is a youth type ministry that's very popular among evangelicals in the United States. We have these guys with a little beard right here and uh, uh, plaid shirts and skinny jeans and three hundred dollar Converse black sneakers. Yeah, you know the type. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's, it's come out, and it's been very successful in evangelizing and helping young people reach Christ. Well, Mike Pilavachi allegedly has been engaging in homoerotic behavior with young men and being a spiritual tyrant to them, having people give him naked massages, wrestling with young men. We're not talking kids now. We're talking teenagers, college-age kids. And the problem is that this has been going on for 20 years, and the board of Soul Survivor Ministries has had complaints. And the attitude is, well, we don't want to mess up a good thing. Because it's sort of like Michael Jackson on stage. He's a go-to guy. You can't get a better entertainer than Michael Jackson. I just don't want my eight-year-old spending the night with him at a sleepover. Now, I'm not saying Mike Pilavachi has, Pilavachi has done anything criminal, not saying that at all. But Soul Survivors Board took the attitude that we're just not going to mess up a good thing. And it's only when the news of his misbehavior became public and he was suspended by the Church of England in a safeguarding inquiry from the diocese, I think of St. Albans, was instituted. Mm -hmm. So this is another example of but, institutional cover up and pr protect you know the brand over protect the child 
we that happened in Anglican circles with uh, Ravi Zacharias. Mm. You know, where uh, you and, know, he, he, famous apologist, but he was he was uh, above reproach only in word only. You know, and I don't know, don't know Mike uh, Pilavachi. Never met him. Don't know anything about him. So I can't really comment on stuff, but this is the sort of thing that we learned in our course on exorcism. That when a priest becomes full of himself, when he thinks that it's me, me, me who's doing these wonderful things, that's the exact moment that Satan takes you and twists you and turns you into a Ravi Zacharias. Or uh, the fellow who started uh, Jean Vanier, the fellow who started the uh, uh, charity for disabled people. He was a sexual predator. And I don't know if Pilavachi is one. I have no idea. But this is how Satan works. It, this story has been told many, many times. Yeah, sure. And it'll be Billy told Gra again when there's no oversight. Mm -hmm. Billy Graham was famous for saying, if you can pray for me, pray that I would never be tempted by women or money. You know, and, and when we see the fall of uh, evangelists and apologetics, apologists, whatever you want to call it, uh, and Christian leaders around the world, it's one of two things. You know, it, it's never somebody who had a too big a go of a goldfish collection. It's it's somebody who fell for uh, pride, money, or, or uh, women. So, so, so whatever, so whatever, this could be also, also this could also be a case. It's not out of the realm of possibility of blackmail from money. Oh, sure. Yeah. Where you've got people, just like happened to Cardinal Pell in Australia, you have people who told lies to basically destroy him and his church and get money out of him. It was all a lie. Uh, so I have no idea. So what? But the answer to all of this is we pray for Mike Pilavachi, Pivalachi. And we pray for all those involved in this situation that they may repent of their sins, maybe uh, may allow God to cleanse them and to go forward in faith and joy. On to next news story: Living Love and Faith. So the document, the report, the the whole hodgepodge of Living Life of Faith that destroyed the Anglican Communion is about to take down the Church of England will not be officially released yet till this fall, George. Yeah, the drip, drip, drip of the death by a thousand cuts of the Church of England will not be over in July, mm -hmm. which is what Synod was told in February, but it'll be over in November. So they haven't had time to finish all the work on this, so they only have a half day devoted to General Synod uh, this July on living in love and faith. Now, I, let me just say that... Uh, Things are tough right now for conservatives, traditionalists in the Church of England, especially those involved in the politics and the higher ministries. Keith Sinclair has stepped down as the head of the Church of England Evangelical Council. He's been placed by John Dunnett, great guy, but John's not a bishop. And so the one bishop who was willing to go to GAFCON 4 and really hammer the Church of England has retired. He's, he's already retired as bishop of as an acting bishop, but now he's retired from the parachurch ministries. So there's no real leadership there. And second, um, they had a Zoom conference of clergy delegates, deputies to General Synod, and it was all supposed to be confidential. Well, the Church of England, uh, Church Times wrote a story about this, where basically everybody's happy, we're all moving forward, and great things are going to happen and we need to work together and all this and that. Well, I talked to some conservative evangelicals and traditional Sango Catholics who attended this meeting. They said they tuned out after about the first 10 or 15 minutes because it was obvious that there was no change, no going back. And you had one person who was identified as a bishop saying, well, homosexuality is just like getting shellfish. It's just one of those things that they were against in the Old Testament that we modern people don't need to be against. And at that point, the fellow who was writing to me said, you know, I tuned out because something so silly, if not stupid, because, you know, there's a whole teaching of the church on, on the uh, dietary laws versus the moral laws. Christ did not come to overturn the moral laws, but he completed... Yeah, you know, all that stuff. And you've got a bishop who just doesn't know his Bible or theology saying this stuff. 
And the attitude was, you know, go along or get out. That was what was expressed at this uh, Zoom meeting. It wasn't all rose. It was roses and happiness and love and joy for those who advocates for this, but uh, nobody else. So, you're saying from what you've heard that the the conservatives are are giving up. Th- this is going to happen. They're not so much giving up. There's just anarchy. Okay. Justin Weld and so. There are some who are giving up. Mm-hmm. If you are the rector of a wealthy parish that is important in your diocese, you're not giving up. You've got a lot at stake. You can fight the good fight, St. Helens, Bishop Gates, and the others. If you're a parish that is in a poor or urban area, deprived area, and you rely upon the diocese to support your stipend and everything, you're giving up. Diocese of Leicester has let it be known that they've compiled a list of those suspect clergy whom they think are not going to be loyal to the party. And they've already stopped sending money to these parishes, I'm told, by somebody who was receiving money and is now no longer receiving money to keep his operation going. The Diocese of Leicester would rather hire some more diversity uh, staffers at the diocesan level and support a perhaps breakaway priest in a one year, five years time. Um, there's also a clamp down on lay people, especially lay members of synod who speak out against the juggernaut of pro-gay juggernaut. They're harassed. They're beaten up verbally. They're put through the bureaucratic ringers. If you know, if you question the trans agenda or the gay agenda, you're engaged in hate speech. We had an incident where the two archbishops, Canterbury and York, called out Sam Margrave, a lay member of Synod uh, from Coventry, I think, Mm -hmm. for basically speaking the gospel truth. And they said, you know, it was a stupid thing for the archbishops to do because there's no consequences if Sam disobeys them. But, you know, if you've got your bishop and the archdeacon and the diocesan staff piling on too, after a while you just say to yourself, what is the point of it all? And I'm not surprised this is happening because these people who are piling on the faithful need to get rid of them or they lose their jobs or they lose their positions or they are pointed out to be charlatans. Well, they're not just they're, yeah, they're not just getting rid of them. They have to actually you know, pummel them. You know, it, mm. it's this is a spiritual battle, not a, a mm. battle of promoting or demoting. This is this is a, a, a certainly a spiritual battle, and another person fighting or losing a spiritual battle. We'll have to see how it works out. Charlie Holt, bishop elect for the Diocese of Florida, has lost Ohio and gained Texas. That's a great headline, by the way. Now, I always used to wonder when I went to general convention uh, for the Episcopal Church, <coughs> happens every three years, which diocese is the most progressive? And it, it was never, you know, it was easy at one point to figure it out. Now it's a competition. Uh, well, I don't think progressive is the right word. I think addled, uh, confused, <laughs> confused. Okay. goofy. Goofy. Uh, Satanic. Stand, goofy, yeah. For those unaware, to be, after you're elected bishop by a diocese, your name is sent to all the bishops and diocesan standing committees mm-hmm. in the Episcopal Church. I believe there are 105 of them. And you must get back a majority, 50% plus one approval. Our bishop, Justin Holcomb, who is uh, consecrated next month, got that pretty quickly. Charlie Holt, is that's taken time, and Ohio Standing Committee took the unusual step of writing an open letter saying this is why we're voting against it. And nothing to do with Charlie, but they think the Diocese of Florida is racist and homophobic and this and that and the other. And by their standards, it's true because John Howard doesn't allow non-celibate clergy when they're retired to become active members of the diocese and clergy team. Neither does Central Florida, but don't <laughs> mention that. What? So 
Ohio, Ohio made a very big stink about this is why we have to vote no. Well, Andrew Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, who I think is a pretty good, probably is going to be on the nominee list for the next presiding bishop to replace Curry. Doyle is the, he's a very capable, energetic man. And he's always in the majority. Uh, whatever the majority is, he's in the majority. Andy Doyle wrote an open letter defending Charlie Holt because Charlie Holt had been in Houston before he was elected bishop in Florida. And he talked about uh, the importance of allowing Florida to choose Florida's bishop. We didn't force New, York, New Hampshire not to choose Gene Robinson. Why should we go the other direction and not allow Florida to choose Charlie Holt? And so on and so forth. So I. Now, is this going to make a difference? Andrew Doyle saying this will make a difference because he carries a great deal of weight. And I think Andrew, I think Charlie Holt will get the consents in the House of Bishops about the problem. It's the diocesan standing committees that he may get hung up on. But Ohio is the diocese that, from which the last general convention had these resolutions uh, attacking pregnancy resource and crisis centers as mm -hmm. being evil, of, of supporting a five-year-old child to choose transgender surgery. We're talking uh, loony yeah. tunes time here. And so Ohio being against this, they just don't have a grounded sense of reality uh, about the Christian faith and about much else, it seems, their standing committee. So so I don't know if this is fatal, but it's not. But it's surprising that they would go to this public step of making this a, a cat attack on Charlie Holt. Well, at least it's not a, a, a big majority. You don't need three-fourths. 50% uh, plus one is all you need, but I uh, want we'll to see. But uh, Charlie has said some stuff since he's uh, been uh, elected, re-elected, and then elected again, uh, uh, bishop-elect of Florida, that concerns me as to how hard he wants the job. And so, yeah, we'll have to see what happens. You know, there's, there's lots of politics in church, in, in case you haven't figured that out yet. George, I, I thought of another uh, thing while we're talking. Uh, while you were in Rome, it was reported that the Southern Baptists have lost half a million people, members, in 2022. Did you read that? Yes. Yes, I did. <laughs> I didn't know that tech needed competition, but hey. No, I Actually, I thought you were going to raise the story about Justin Welby being convicted in court of speeding. I thought okay. that was a yeah. bigger story. I, okay, your biggest, you got back from New Wineskins or whatever, or at one thing uh, in North Carolina, and you go, I got a speeding ticket. <laughs> but he was gone 25, I was gone oh, 85. You're 80, okay. you know, like, come on. I, I had read it a uh, Dodge uh, Charger. Challenger, uh, Ch Charger yeah. with the Hemi. Yeah, you know, I did one of these Hertz sports car rentals to drive up and back, and I was going to see what this car could do. And the cop was nice to write it down to eighty-five. <laughs> Justin Welby was well, clocked at twenty-five in a twenty mile per hour zone. Wait, my mm. gosh! I don't think a car. I don't think. I don't know how you drive at twenty miles per hour. It's uh, uh, Sasquatch. My motorhome can't idle less than 30 35 so i don't know yeah it's, at 30 miles an hour i'm pressing the brakes the whole time to be at 25 with a diesel engine and my, so. and my ticket was only 200 some dollars just <laughs> well he's got to pay 500 pounds for going oh, 100 pounds for every mile per hour open oh. now he said that uh, he tried to it would have been 300 pounds if he had paid the ticket online but evidently the system went down but the court didn't believe him and makes him pay the fine plus court costs at 200 so he's 510 pounds poor justin just can't get a break i feel badly okay. for the guy may justin's speeding ticket be the most non-story of 2023 that's my hope i'm kevin colson and i'm george conger and you've been watching episode 802 of anglican unscripted mm -hmm.